just before I dive into that, can I just close the last conversation? Oh my, two seconds. Whatever you want. No, 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 no. I just want to close it. Uh, I think what Jerry needs is something closer to what we were describing with Wendy last week. And that's a different conversation. Bill, you're asking, what's the bottom most? <laughs> well, I was trying to look at your slides and think about when you're speaking and the examples you use. And I'm like, now it's just, I mean, I think this is more about me than you all, but uh, I'm just trying to get a model in my mind of what the kinds of relations are among the sort of as Isaiah Berlin wrote a whole book on concepts and categories in what uh, <laughs> in what you're attempting to do, which I think is really, um, well, I like it because I think if I'm ever going to, if I'm going to live long enough to have an intelligent conversation with a machine, <laughs> we're going to need something better than we have now. <laughs> that's the, yeah. And that's, that's not even in my prime goals. I'm trying something much more difficult or much simpler, I don't know. Probably yes. both. Yeah, both. It, both. <laughs> it, both. It's to for people to have more clearer conversations with one another at scale. And the at scale is really difficult here. But um, is there, okay, it's in a way, I'm dealing with speech acts, so it's language all the way down. Um, yeah, I know, but even with language all the way down, at some point you stop. Because yes. you can't go any further down. Well, you know. No, the, and this is where um, I'm not taking a foundational stance here. I'm in the sense that we are like there is this view of the world, and you know, I come from mathematics. So I'm very familiar with that view of the world, where we define the atoms and define everything up from the atoms. And here I'm going more. We have concepts. They're vague. They're not obvious. We don't know what they're made of. We'll never know what they're made of. I'm not, or what they're made of is absolutely impossible to talk about. You know, it's a vague space. It's a sub. It's a subset of the space phase of all the neuron connections in a given brain, and in all the brains of humanity. <laughs> so you know, it's there's no not going to be useful description of that. And, and and my attempt is, is in a way more empirical. It's like, okay, you're naming something, I'm naming something, we may be using the same term or not, but we have a feeling we're talking about the same thing or not, or close. And what, how do we know, or how do we attempt to know that these are the same or not? And we use more claims and more statements. And the question is to make it explicit what are the key distinguishing features or common features that uh, distinguish or unify concepts and, and kind of have a record of that. This word's been used for quite a few things. And for those things, these distinctions have been useful set, uh, prying them apart. Is, it, is the maximum distinction, like the most distinct, most precise concept we can arrive by subdividing and subdividing. Is that the atom? No, it's just the most concept that was pragmatically useful for a given conversation. There may be further distinctions and other conversations. The point is not to arrive at the ultimate maximally distinguished. The, the point is to say, to have a database of here are the known distinctions that have been useful in specific conversations. And if you're having a new conversation using this term, well, know that people have stumbled on those distinctions uh, between different concepts using this term. Yeah, no, I think, and, I think, I think, yes, I, I, I think it's actually the most important thing that we can probably try and do right now. And I really, every time you say it, I really appreciate how you put it. Um, it reminded me, my brother-in-law was uh, studying philosophy or something in college, and he got so frustrated once with Immanuel Kant that he actually diagrammed one of the sentences, which was really challenging. <laughs> and I remember reading some philosophy, and you know, I'm like, okay, I know this is a sentence. I'm going to try and find the verb. <laughs> 
and go from there you know here's the before the verb here's the after the verb and then we got like you know a thousand you know parenthetical distinctions um so i really appreciate that i think um i i i look at this though as a way of trying to take well helping them you know getting some help from computers so we possibly could line up you know textual expository yes. um yes. you know whatever they are resources and say these are you know there's some close connections here that might make sense yeah uh, or to, and, and, and or this was used as a support of that but actually there was a shift in meaning that means that you know it there's a, something iffy about the using this and this argument because it's not talking about the same thing. Yeah, no, I, I think it would, well, it would be great for, uh, well, I don't know, I'm just in very much into trying to get something to work. So it would be great for us to take an example either from an existing discourse in Mattermost or one in, you know, a more or less contained part of the of the email and it's kind of do some lining up i don't want to be worth it i'm just thinking i would like to maybe i'm you know channeling wendy mcplain like let's get a big whiteboard paste these things up get some markers and sticky notes and start making connections amongst these things and writing it down um, yes, no, no, it's absolutely uh, valid. Let me just find something. Um, while we're here. But I think the thing that Mark brought up last time that made me think is a lot about his way of, you know, he's trying to look at poetry. And I found that amusing quote from a friend of mine, Britannica, that said, you know, poetry is the other way of using language, which I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> Um, but there is this other, I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about. Like, in a way, I, we've got to also be able to come together and interact in uh, less explicit or more poetic or some... No, I, not everything, and not everything that I have knowledge of is amenable to like, I'm just going to break it down to, to all the verbal distinctions I can make. That, that's absolutely valid. The, um, and that's a distinction between connotation and denotation, right? The word has a certain denotation. It's supposed to mean this. And then, well, it also brings this all this great cloud of all that it connotates. And, um, And sometimes you mean only one or the other, like racial slurs using uh, animals. When you say, you know, the uh, people of this color are monkeys, that's mm -hmm. obviously not denotational, it's connotational. It's horrible, It's but it's how language works. Uh, and being able to, and the reality is, you know, what is the meaning of that claim? Often the answer is a combination of the, literal and poetic or denotational and connotational meaning and both are intended uh, yeah, yeah. And, be, and being aware of uh, how they're intended is extremely uh, important I, I, I don't want to spend hours on this diagram and no, 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 no. Yeah, right. uh, it's it's not the final word but it's kind of what I'm part of what I'm trying to do is uh, so these are fragments so this is a sentence uh, in context in a certain conversation in a speech act, right? And if you erase the context, you have the raw sentence taken in abstracto. That's the erasure operator. And interpretation happens at this level. You're saying, well, this fragment could be interpreted as, and then what you have is actually also a sentence, but it's a kind of more precise, more, less ambiguous, and hopefully minimally ambiguous 
uh, the paraphrase of the original fragment. Or it could be a formal description. It could be uh, a formal scheme uh, with variables. It, and it doesn't matter. They're all ultimately language acts. They're all ultimately interpretations trying to say this approximate thing, I interpret it in this context to have been intended to mean that. And then you have all the possible interpretations of a fragment because there's many of them. And then you're saying, okay, um, there's that space, the power set of all possible interpretation, if you will, power set here. Um, don't, don't remember what R stands for even, but what I'm saying is if you think of the trying to interpret the sentence in the abstract, what you have is the subset of all possible interpretations. Uh, so you're kind of going there. Uh, you, you're trying to say, well, in all possible contexts where this sentence was found, so go back on the erasure, and this sentence was possibly found in many contexts. In all of those, it was interpreted in multiple ways. And that gives you a huge set of possible interpretations of the sentence. And how important is this is not absolutely obvious, except when you come upon a new context, you're like, well, here are ways in which this sentence has been interpreted by someone in a certain context. And this is being able to speak about that. And then we can speak about the distinction between those, uh, between the definitions. And that's not in the diagram yet, but this is, yeah, so trying... this is, this is a great, this little R equal, you know, is a, the it looks R... a lot like, it looks a lot like S equals K log W. Just, <laughs> just let me in from, uh, in, uh, in both thermodynamics and information science about entropy. Yeah, the there's that's the subset, right, of things that are, you know, at least in like in like in gas dynamics, the, the arrangement of molecules which are indistinguishable with the current state of this fluid is a measure. Yep. And we call you know that's called was defined as entropy. And so, and I think, you know, Shannon did something similar with information in terms of, you know, it's how we use it in, or you, you have all these other combinations of letters here and it's indistinguishable from this thing. So, and they're at different levels of description. So when I see this, I think you're also, I thought this once, I talked to somebody at Park about this years ago about databases. And I couldn't really make it sense about arrangements of elements with res that are more microscopic than the state I'm actually working in, but there is this kind of levels. Yeah, that yeah, I yeah. Think is might well. Ah, uh, that's that's something might, I want to see. might provide might be valuable. I mean, there might be something in this information entropy piece that is helpful. It may not really even be related. It just you know looks the same. There's lots of that. So no, no, absolutely, and and and. One thing that the topic mappers keep saying, and, and Mark's uh, uh, getting newcom was actually a good thing, and I need to re-watch re these things because I'm still getting intuitions about this, but it makes sense, is that any subject proxy, anything that names, names a topic, so that means any sentence, any fragment, and also I'm realizing data structures in data, like a row in a database, what is it? It's also a fragment. It's a subject proxy. So it's something that is supposed to be interpreted as something else. Oh, and by the way, this little R here is about the fact that, oh, let me represent that more precise definition as a sentence, because maybe it's a data structure, and then I want to represent it as a, sen as a sentence. Or I want to pick out, and this is, this is actually important, this is injective. Uh, I want to be able to say for every there's a kind of many-to-many -many definition uh, relation between sentences and meanings, and meanings are not there, but definitions stand for meaning. But when you have done the distinction work, you've got still a subset because you're using equivalence class of things that mean the same, so you have a smaller space. Though it's probably infinite in both cases, but doesn't matter, it's still smaller because it's a quotient space of meanings 
And for those, it should be possible to pick, okay, let's pick one or even many representatives such that this arrow is injective. There's no overlap. There's no two concepts that pick the same representative. Even if a, if, a, if a definition may have many representations, there's never a representation that stands for two concepts. Is that possible? Theoretically, yes, except it is. Uh, I don't have a construction for it. So this is a non-constructive axiom of choice uh, thing, countable choice, which I'm always more fine with than absolute choice. But getting constructive about this would be nice. But if you think of it as incremental, it's perfectly doable, right? Whenever you introduce a new distinction, this is where you uh, adjust the R's. If you don't, if you don't force R's to be constant in time, if you view it as an incremental monotonic system, oh, I've got a new definition. I've shown it's different, so I can make sure that the R is different, that the representation is different, and doesn't reuse a pre-existing representation. Anyway, that's. <laughs> Sorry, getting a bit deep in the maths of this, but this is no. I think it's uh... why I'm not coding yet. <laughs> I'm still str making sure that I've got some of those right. Well, I'll struggle along and see if I can put something into my gray cells that seems congruent. Um... Anyway, uh, where else? No, I think this is, hi, Michael. Hey, Michael. We just finished a pretty philosophical conversation about hyperknowledge and a totally non-philosophical conversation about meme brain and the brain. So <laughs> feel free to introduce something. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I got nothing. Um, got well, I'll think about see if I can think of something. <laughs> There's an idea of vocabulary I stumbled on recently that worries about it's more for library science and are two resources the same? And I'm wondering how much of this can be leveraged for saying are two data objects in, in disparate systems, the same or talking about the same thing or equivalent, the, you know, representations of the same entity. So I just okay. have a very personal example that just popped in my head about what you're talking about that actually affects my life. And it's the representation of my recent medical history in the records of different doctors, all of whom, have had some part. And if we talk English, they'll go, yeah, 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 yeah. But if people look at records, it's like, I'm looking at my records, I'm like, what the hell? I mean, there's some silly example. That one record, when I was first seeing this cardiologist, they, they showed me, here's your medical record. And it says you had a tonsillectomy in like, you know, 2012. I'm like, well, actually my tonsillectomy was in, <clears throat> 1948 so i don't have any idea where you got this information from <laughs> we're like what i was like pretty much flabbergasted you know and i had, had my spleen removed nobody's got to know to that i'm like isn't that important i don't i don't know you know and just the i mean in a way the kind of discrepancies that might be assisted by a system that Mark Antoine that you're looking at could be really useful because the people who are operating, you know, like the doctors in their offices, they got work to do and it isn't, you know, necessarily, you know, keyboarding. <laughs> they have other things to be concerned about. <laughs> And let's you not know, go into the nightmares that are most uh, data entering interfaces for doctors. Oh, I know, I know. Well, some of them just have a lot of, the ones I've seen recently have a lot of free text. So they're pretty happy just typing away like a bandit while you chit chat. I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> as long as you can make sense of it later, I guess I'm happy. But, but it just struck me about how things are different 
and in ways that are, you know, can be pretty important. And where maybe that's a bounded enough space where something could happen because, you know, I don't know. I'll stop free associating here. No, no, that's, that, that, that's perfectly appropriate. Um, what was I gonna say? Hmm. The, I mean, that's a generic problem, right? <clears throat> You're trying to find, does this entity correspond to that one? And then you find that they don't correspond in some way. And the non-correspondence is a data error, <laughs> an input error. Uh, so if you work from a purely logical framework, you'll say, oh, these things don't match, they must be different. And if you look from a more empirical standpoint, and I have no answer for that, by the way, because that I'm not there yet, but it's something I expect to get into. It's like, there's a discrepancy. Some people say this is the same, but there's this logical inconsistency. What does that mean? Does it mean that people saying it's the same are wrong, or does it mean that the discrepancy points to an error somewhere on the record? Can, how, how do we resolve these contradictory claims about equivalence or any contradictory claim in general, but they often boil down to equivalence, right? <laughs> yeah. I want, I mean, I'm, I'm anxious here. I want the computers to goddamn do the work. <laughs> you know, you need to help us. We really need help here. The, 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 what <laughs> the computers can help us with is making sure that they've seen all the options or at least enough of the options, which, because they do it faster than us, but deciding between different contradictory statements, which one is the right one, that's a human job. But identifying, hey, there's a contradiction here. Somebody please resolve this. Yeah, I should bloody hope. Well, probably, as you say, I mean, I know that's true, but probably most people who are on the other end but like, you know, like the nurse practitioner I talked to the other day, she goes, you know, well, I got work. I don't have time for this. I got patients I need to actually talk yeah. to. So, you know, and there's only 24 hours in a day. So that's it. No, you know, I understand. I mean, it, it's a complicated problem, but I, you know. No, no. The, the, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. It strikes me that there's a there's a relevant kind of simplistic um, exercise in notarization, essentially, where needed. That if you're, I, I'm thinking about my contacts, my you know my address book. I have, um, you know. Um, 5,000 people in my, you know, in my contacts that I've merged from, you know, this stuff was on, you know, my Palm Pilot and this was on my, you know, all this, all these things that have survived, some of which are redundant, among which there are discrepancies. And what the software's job is to say, hey, I see a discrepancy here, which, which would you like to keep? And in a case where I know, I can just answer that, no big deal. But in a case where a medical professional has to like notarize or, or you know, kind of make, make official the correct resolution to the discrepancy, that should be something that could come up. I mean, you know, in, in system building, one would, and, and this could be true for contacts too. I don't know which of these contacts are, are, are right you know, ping the person being contacted and ask which is the which is the right current contact information for them. Um, and, you know, ping the medical professional and it's probably a, 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 an administrative level job, not the, the doctor's job to say, yes, you know, we saw this person and performed this procedure. Oops, we, saw, we forgot to enter it in wherever um but that that's the that seems like the model 
that again is the decentralized model that puts you know my contacts are all in my hand my medical records are all in my hands and only when i need information notarized or you know to to pull something in then i can yeah, I agree totally with that. And 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 for me, what one thing, one intuition that's been important, and thank you for to Brooke Zelenka for putting that in my head. And it's so obvious because she, she's an awesome functional programmer. It's when you have a discrepancy, materialize it. And when you have the resolution of a discrepancy due to some user's action, materialize that. So again, track record. But materializing discrepancies, materializing the kind of fork point and decision points is fundamental when you're speaking about social knowledge. If everybody owns their knowledge and everybody has decentralized, that means there will be conflict. And that means people must be aware of the conflict. That means a conflict must become a thing. Hey, there's this object representing the fact that this is in conflict with that. And there's an object representing, hey, this has been resolved by according to this person. Who you trust or don't. And then you can say, okay, here's how I would resolve it. And then there's again a conflict between two different people who vouch for different things. And then somebody else will say, okay, this is how I would resolve it. And do you trust that person to become an arbiter on in that dispute? And all these are records. And and the 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 aggregate of the conflict resolution representations can be instructive in itself if you know nothing you know exactly um 27 people have weighed in on this on this contradiction and you know they're they're in three different camps um and that is useful is information aggregate, aggregate data on the people who are weighing in um you know i always go to the exam you know the 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 climate science point that is there are equal people vouching that this is true and this isn't true but the people who are vouching that it is true happen to all be climate scientists might mean something yeah might mean something <laughs> no, absolutely yeah brooklyn zelenka fission i have occasional conversations with her about this and she's been a huge help Clarifying certain things. <clears throat> the um, so yeah, uh, yeah. That's also my viewpoint: decentralize and materialize. The the, the one one thing I'm moving more and more systematically away from is this: there is one state. The social state is necessarily a superposition of states, <laughs> mm. and 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 uh, and their attempts at resolution may be part of the superposition of states, but they're still part of the social state. <laughs> and that's what I mean. Keep saying when I say social truth value, social truth value must show. Oh. Here's the polarization. Here's the reasons for the polarization. Here's what different people have vouched for. Yeah. Conflict discrepancy in any fork point, right? I keep speaking about a GitHub metaphor. Well, the fork point is an object. The and the merge point, if any, attempts at merging are objects. Nothing to add to that. <laughs> but you're right, Bill. Uh, you're a doctor. You're in the middle of things. Do you want this complex social truth? Or do you want, OK, what can I act on now? <laughs> right? And that's everybody's reality. We have these extremely complex decisions. And uh, in theory, there's all this nuance that should apply. And in practice, we want to move on with our lives. Um, and this kind of inconsistency between how to make this work as a nuance and how to make this work as a 
uh, well, here's a best guess. Let, 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 sorry, let, let me let me get back to your um, Palm Pilot example, Michael, because it's a good one. If there's a conflict about addresses between my old Palm Pilot archive, yes, I used to have one, and my uh, say current Gmail contact list, I say you know 99% of the time, if there's a conflict. Choose Gmail because it's more recent. Uh, fill the holes with the Palm Pilot. But if there's something that is present in both, forget it, Gmail wins. In the case of the, the doctor thing, it's, uh, well, okay, if something's missing, you have, let's say you have a record saying this procedure was done and no record of the procedure itself. That's a good example. So somebody's claiming there's been a procedure, somebody else is, and there's no trace of the procedure in the system. What do you believe? Uh, well, maybe you will, that's a business rule. It, make, it makes perfect sense to say, we know that sometimes procedures are not entered in the system. So that means a statement is more likely to be correct than just saying, oh, it's not there, it's not there. Uh, so that's a business rule. And it should be possible to have business rules saying the default resolution of a um, specific type of conflict, specific conflict pattern is this one. Doesn't mean it cannot be revisited. There should still be something showing the, the user, hey, there was a conflict. This is how we resolved it automatically using business rules because I know you're in a hurry and you don't want to dig into this now, but be aware that there's something there and that you may want to dig into it if it's really important. And that's again, a judgment call, but being able to have these business rules. And just as I keep saying, there's the, the social truth is one thing, but the community truth is another. Like this community has decided we use majority rule, or we use consensus, or we use whatever. Uh, we use seniority. <laughs> we use dictatorship. It's a social, it's a community rule. <laughs> uh, and that's how we resolve conflict. It's, and then, you know, again, there should be, oh, this rule was applied to, and there was a conflict and this rule was applied to resolve it. But saying that said, this community can speak as one voice is also valid because they use a community rule. Yeah. Mm. And not dig into the nuance and history all the time <laughs> because that's not viable. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, I mean, so the interesting thing for me, just one more example from this little medical thing when I went to see this Heart Institute, when I first looked at the record, they had produced a medical history, they had a medical history of mine so I called my GP and they said, nobody has those. And I looked at their records, which is quite accurate about my childhood diseases and all this other stuff. So I'm like, so where the hell did the, did the cardiology people get this thing? I mean, that was like, what? And I had to call twice and basically walk through and say, here, I want you to fix this record <laughs> so that it's, to me, reads more like, yeah, the medical history I've written for myself, you know? And I was like, wow. So that's really, I just thought that was, first of all, I thought they would have asked my GP since he referred me. And he has a, like, a, you know, a pretty nice textual medical history of childhood diseases and all this other stuff. And I'm like, Yowza. <laughs> so that's just, that's weird to me. That they had access to it. To no, that they had access to whatever they had. And it, you know, was kind of so, in a way, so, not, you know, but off the mark in many, what I thought were important. Ouch. Yeah, <laughs> like, I was thinking to myself, wait, are we flying blind here? What is the deal? <laughs> no, no, and, and you are lucky you saw it. How many people are never aware of the discrepancies, right? 
well, I'm just, you know, a little anal. Oh, you have a history? <laughs> what do you have to say about me? <laughs> you know, this goes back to a long time. My friends and I we were talking, well, it came up because uh, here in Texas, there's all this stuff about voter identity. And, I, and we were joking, and I think Peter might have heard this before, but like somebody, you know, it's a, well, you produce your birth certificate. Well, I'm of an age that my birth certificate is a handwritten piece of paper with a seal on a stamp on it. It has no, you know, footprint, toe print, anything. It's got some human wrote this name down and this date, you know, and like, you know, squashed a seal on a piece of paper. I'm like, so a friend of mine said, yes, the idea that one could prove one's identity is really, you know, that's not as easy. <laughs> to do and, and as one might to think you know people say you know where were you born i'm like i don't know but i'm told it was here <laughs> you know <laughs> yes so i mean my earliest recollection was when i was like you know, three i went through this with a psychologist once it was super interesting to try and fish out the first thing i remembered <laughs> But I was like three years old or something. I have very few early memories. Early meaning before, say, grade nine. Yeah, I just have a few of these. This one when I was very, very young and staring down at the East River from an apartment way up in a building in the Bronx. <laughs> I'm just like, I do remember that somehow. Yeah. The very few uh, memories that are sort of place memories of this place that we lived in till I was two and a half. So they're definitely my earliest memories. And, wow. um, and I, but there's, there's an edge to them where I don't know, just as is true with memory, having shared those memories, like with my parents, what embellishments to what I now consider my memory came from, you know, came from their input or something. Oh yeah, there's all kinds of stories. <laughs> and, and pictures. My father took a lot of pictures. I have a lot of what I think of as memories of my youth uh, and um, which are clearly memories yeah. of the pictures. But the reality is also in my case, I have very little visual memory. My memory is linguistic mm, mm, mm. and that means anything pre-linguistic is gone yeah that's interesting because all my memories are visual of, of that time or you know it's like i have this the, the the most interesting one to me is i have this memory of looking at the sky and there was what I later found out in conversation were industrial smokestacks, but there were these things that black smoke came out of. We lived in Cleveland near the industrial area. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't understand why I could see this black smoke coming out and it was coming out pretty fast. So how did the sky stay blue? <laughs> yes, yeah. that was my memory. <laughs> That's, a good question. That's why you want really young kids in the science class, just to give the teacher a run for their money. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and the good thing about that piece is I know it's not something that was told to me because what adult would wonder that, you know, it was just like, you know, it was just like a naive question in my, in my head. Yeah, but the, the adult I would wonder about it would, be, would be the person like me in graduate school studying gas dynamics. Like, so what is actually happening there? <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, folks, we're chatting, which is nice, but uh, it's, it's a long day and... Get back to work. I may have to get back to work. We'll play. Sorry. Well, yeah, I think I let everybody off the path here, but uh... no, 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 no. We weren't on a clear path before. It's a great before. call. 
it's a great call. No, no, it's it's fine. Uh, but I mean, we were not on a clear path. We were. I, I did try a few times to say, you know, all I'm saying about concepts is also true about data objects, right? The work that Vincent does linking, you know, here's a presentation of a community in Trove, and here's the website of the community, and they're about the same thing. <laughs> So, yeah, no, so this is, no, this is, I think this is really, this would be nice to sketch out in some ways because I know it's clear to you, Mark Antoine, I don't always think about that. So I get a little confused for myself about trying to make use of the framework you're presenting, which I like to the extent I really understand it. And examples that don't to me sound like, well, everything is just one of these things, you know, so it's really no big deal, which sometimes you're like, <laughs> no, no, it is a big deal. No, this it is, you know, it, it, even though everything, you know, everything is all connected, you know, like a thermodynamics, the first law of energy is neither created nor destroyed. That's terrific. On the other hand, you know, I still want to make breakfast. So, <laughs> um, so I think it would be nice to have these other examples so that, that are, yeah you know what i mean because when you say well you know then it's just a data point i'm like wait a minute that's like a reductive statement i'm like where did we go and so i know it's important to make the connections i think i you're not trying to reduce everything to this like everything is just like this because then there's really well the conversation's over now right because <laughs> no which is definitely not what i'm trying to do i i'm tr i'm trying but i'm trying to say this in a way, I'm making it worse. I'm saying this simple problem is like this complicated problem. <laughs> no, no, well, uh, you, but, I was, this is a little short story. I was a member of a little group at Xerox Park, actually outside Xerox Park. There was this Institute on Research and Learning and a few people. And I got it roped in and we called ourselves the group of people interested in boring things. So we actually got money and had a little workshop. So it was super interesting more like uh, the woman when the sociologist was there he said you know if things aren't interesting it means you're not looking close enough or if it's boring yeah yeah you're not looking close enough so so i appreciate the fact that you're making things that are simple you know exposing some of the facets of them the, the, cur curious speed what you said about programming the your quote why is it why did you see this as relevant it's not relevant at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it's a total non sequitur, but I, I think that people here would appreciate it. That's why. That sense was what kept me away from programming. Well, yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, it, it really, that's, that encapsulates something that I didn't actually, I never put into words, but there's something about, uh, code and and you know coming out of design where like you have x givens and you create a solution that you know has an aesthetic layer to it but but you know at, at its basis you're solving a problem and then it's done and and the the kind of never endingness of programming and coding and uncovering the little thing that makes the thing that you built on something else not really work. <laughs> it just like scared the hell out of me. Yeah. The, the, the never endingness is there, but on the other hand, programming means you can actually build that design. <laughs> For me, it's, it's, it's one thing I used to say about programming and I don't think it's true anymore. Uh, I love programming because it's one of the last crafts in the sense one good craftsman can create a unique piece uh, as opposed to industrialized design where you're a team of people repeating micro actions and the work is nobody's work and doesn't have the trace of many people's except the designer, <laughs> but the, the, the doers don't have real input. 
uh, and it's still true that the, 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 the makers have an input in programming. And that's something I still appreciate about yeah, programming. Well, take, yeah, well, it's the same true as almost anything. I mean, you know, writing good system requirements is, a, is craft work too. The, true. It really is, right? Because in order to like, you know, put, put English words together in a way that somebody else isn't going to like, <laughs> from the Mark Antoine thing, be in an alternate space using these words for something completely different. <laughs> The the the, yeah. the the swing caricature, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. right. Um, <laughs> the the uh, <laughs> and you're right. The, the, the what I'm saying is the it's true if you view the requirement as an artifact. On the other hand, the requirement is one step in the process leading to an artifact. And the artifact is very much a team effort, which on the one hand is wonderful. I love team efforts. And, and I love contributing to team efforts. Uh, but on the other hand, there are some team efforts where you feel that the individual contributions disappear. Now, for me, the software requirements are very much still part of a crafts shop process because the work of the individual worker still probably matters. And it's definitely not true in a Taylorist you know, chain Monta, uh, what do you call it again? Uh, an assembly line. Thank you. Yeah, you're right, right. Yeah. Uh, it's assembly, like it's craft as opposed to assembly line. Uh, but you're right. Many things are craft as part of. But the question is, is it as part of an assembly line or as part of a individual craft workshop, collective craft team, or assembly line? And there's a continuum there. And for me, programming is still very close to the start of that line. Mm. I worked on an assembly line, so there's even, you can't get away from even being, doing it well or poorly. Oh, so I'm there sure is some true. craft involved in actually being able to operate these machines. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a skill. they're produced. Yeah. It's a skill. And you have to pay attention while you're doing it. You can't just stand around and watch it do its thing. So, but for me, there's a difference between the skill and the craft in the sense that doing it well, you become invisible. Doing a craft well, your personal stamp is on it. Yeah, I know. I, you know, I understand that distinction. I just... Um, I but anyway, that's, ju that's just me waxing uh, a bit uh, romantic about why I love programming. Uh, that's pretty crafty use of language there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh... <laughs> but again, I mean, some of that is leaving. And... I, I feel the same way about programming. I, so I agree. So the, these three observations, like so true. It's, it's really funny. Uh, just down to Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, not having enough memory in their PDB 11. Oh, yes. <laughs> Which was briefly going to be too much code. <laughs> I did not yeah. know that last one. Which last one? I like the and the chat and in right, C, yeah. and having lower precedence than equal. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm so glad I'm not programming in C. <laughs> So I just read a little thing last week about languages that are gonna going off to die that won't be around anymore. So there's a bunch of visual basic visual.net, Ruby, Perl. Yeah, Perl is they basically we're not doing anymore with this language. We're like we're done. Um, it's it's funny how Perl five killed Perl, basically. It was Perl six that where they Pearl said six, okay sorry. Perl six we're like okay we it's too complicated. no we're stopping now because the <laughs> hole is the hole is too deep and, Can't do it. and we'd like to get out. <laughs> that, that that's a great example of abstraction going wrong. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it needs to be studied. Yes, the um, abstraction astronauts. I heard somebody say 
And, and I'm I'm totally an abstraction astronaut, so I'm scared. But the yeah, well, uh, okay, Robert Bly is like, yeah, you need to put your, need to put your feet on the ground here, folks. <laughs> yeah, the poet it was great about that. No, no, it's 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 a real it's a real concern, and and Pearl Six is a really a cautionary tale. It's it's important. We need to we need to remember those. The Ruby is interesting. Uh, because there's tons of great ideas in Ruby. There's tons of stuff I hate in Ruby. But one thing I noticed is that they became so good at DSLs uh, that everybody was doing DSLs and that killed the readability of the language because everybody's creating a, a, pri a private sub-language. And yeah, the readability was not a primary concern. And I'd say the same is true with Pearl. So if there's, if, yeah. Well. <laughs> oh my God. And the same with APL. Oh uh, yeah, that was always fun. Yeah. The, the, I, I used to joke that APL was, uh, was the first uh, write once, read never language. <laughs> uh, well, Ken the, Iverson, I, I met him once because I worked for a company who actually, you know, supported APL and stuff. And he was like, what I love it. He says, yeah, you get says you can't hurt the machine you type whatever you want there <laughs> and, and, and i have a tendency to try to make some terse things sometime and i really watch myself because terse is harder to read harder to correct harder to debug harder to everything and that way, you know, as as said in the Zen of Python, explicit is better than implicit. I just had a conversation with Jack, actually. He was speaking about closure because he's been doing a lot of closure recently. And he said, oh, I've noticed coming from Java that closure uses less interfaces. They don't tend to program to interface. And I said, okay, I don't know, but my personal guess, I don't think you have big closure teams. You have a few very smart lone wolves doing things. Uh, and sometimes people come after that and follow, but I don't think you have big closure teams and design by interface is very much to, you know, Conway's law. <laughs> it's a way to allow teams to become, in, sub teams become independent of one another because they can talk to the interface instead of having to know everything the other team knows. So it's a way to hide and encapsulate knowledge. And if in, in smaller projects, you don't need as much encapsulation uh, or in, you know, a genius one, you know, uh, few one or few player projects, you don't need encapsulation. And I said, and, and Python meanwhile, went for not designed by interface, but duck typing, which I think was more appropriate to uh, random com contributors and on the internet versus teams like more disjointed teams. Mm -hmm. So you go for duck typing as opposed to interface. I, this is intuition. I may not be right about this, but it feels right. I don't know if you relate to that. It sounds right. Well, I'm just a novice uh, Python dabbler here. So I just, you know, I've been Python. trying and I've been trying to write simple scripts to, I just want to write them in a way that I think will be readable to me later. But I'm very much a functional like, man, if I can nest this in this and don't need an extra variable, I'm going for it because, you know, I don't want the temporary variable hanging around if I don't, if I really don't need it. I, so. I, I have that functional-ish preference, though I'm not trained in functional. But Python is still my weapon of choice because the emphasis on readability is great. And, and that way... We will choose in, Py in, in true Pythonic software. We will choose the intermediate variable if it allows me to explain. If the name of the variable allows me to explain what I'm doing. Hey. I actually went to, actually, I channeled you when I did this because I actually made that distinction. Yeah. Because I had some embedded function in a function and I realized this thing is completely unreadable. I mean, it's, and it, it works great, and it doesn't, you know, it, but I and, realize... And readability is a prime, prime, prime value in the, in the Python community. Maybe less so now, but at the beginning of the Python language, readability was a fundamental value. 
Yeah, there are a few idioms, right? There are a few idioms to learn about. Here's a convenient way to do this kind of thing. That's where you get used to a a kind of syntax. Yeah. But yeah. And I think that's that's one thing that Ruby got wrong. They didn't put readability as the as a prime directive. Yeah, that was interesting. I, this little article about language Ruby loose is just this basically, you know, there's just not that many people interested in writing Ruby code anymore. Other thing, you know, it's just going to fade away because it doesn't really have a future. So. You know, it's, it, that's actually interesting because for a while, part of part of it is like follow on frameworks and stuff like that. Um, so Python has a huge amount of library support for, you know, anything you want to do. There's, you know, somebody has written a module for it already. Um, for a long time, Ruby on Rails was the, the you know, the web Kill development. Up. Yeah. Yep. So it's interesting that, that that kind of didn't didn't keep up. It's like the world of fashion. One day you're in, the next day you're out. <laughs> trying to go beyond fashion and saying okay what was this about and what's the explanation for this one because i think there's an explanation but maybe i'm just projecting of course mm. they'll have to dig it out there's an old Erwin schrodinger um, essay on uh, science being fashion of the times he was writing about in the 1900s about how certain ideas just were you know it was fashionable to think this way but <laughs> Yeah, humans get captured by by herd mentality. Yeah, I'm good. To, so I have a few of, I don't know, it's a little massive wiki thing. I've been working my little brain to the bone here, trying to figure out how to make my massive wiki better. And so maybe Pete, you and I got to like massive wiki builder requirements. But yeah, and I'm still trying to get the sync thing populated. I want to, I really want to get this. Mark Antoine, I don't know if you know, but Pete introduced me and uh, Mark Carranza to this little thing called Sync Thing, S-Y-N-C-T-H-I-N-G. Yeah. So it's really peer-to-peer. We have it running on our three machines, which is always fun because sometimes Pete's disconnected or I'm over here and, you know, but I've been like adding things and they get like propagated. You know, you can see, oh my God, it's trying to sync with those other machines. But it's trying to get away from Git as being the repository sharing aspect for the massive wiki. So could we really have, you know, distributed peers? Well, you, you, you saw we uh, Pete brought up, and I kept bringing up back to him the Pijul uh, system as an alternative, as a distributed alternative. Really interesting. Oh, I just want to say, yeah. I, so Pichuel is, is kind of the, it, it's like get improved. Um, the, the thing that we're getting away, so the, the, the observation I've got is that our ma- massive wiki use never reached real Git collaboration. We're just using Git collaboration for, for syncing stuff instead of using branches and fork and pull and things like that, which I was hoping we would get to and someday we will, uh, some subset of us anyway. But um, there's a bunch of people who just want the thing to sync and they don't really care about check-ins and check-outs and branching and all that kind of crap. So um, sync thing, PGL is is probably better for Git um, uh, or you know it's a good replacement for Git even though it's not as ubiquitous. Um, but then sync thing is just, it just works and it kind of you know makes makes the data kind of and it's in the background around. if it's running and so you're you're just like you know using your editor or obsidian and just typing stuff and making you know and just doing it and but what are the risks of collision on sync thing how does it handle collisions it doesn't. Um, well. it, it's, it's actually a feature that it doesn't um because so so visual actually does a better job of collision management than git um which is cool um uh but uh but it doesn't. Sync thing doesn't. What it does, it, what it will do, uh, it's got a couple different variations of, uh, hey, what do you want me to do with this file if it gets overwritten? And and the default is actually nothing. You just blow it away. I don't care. <laughs> but uh, the the mode that we're using is is called trash can, um, where it's like, well, okay, I'm going to overwrite this file, but I'll I'll save the one that you had to a trash can folder, um, and you can set the number that you want, and we've. Got it right now set to infinite 
So, um, so theoretically, we're we're at least accumulating a, a log trail of stuff that we could rubbish through. And if somebody said, "Oh my God, my my paragraph was so brilliant, and now it's gone," it's it's lying around in the trash somewhere, which is good enough for the the. Oh, okay. So well, yeah. so it's it's a weird way of handling. Well, well it, I I mean I don't I haven't looked it's at kind of good enough. I haven't but I just want us to pick one thing and then say here is how we're using this system and we'll help you get on board. But you know the git thing is really it's gotten in the way. It's a kind of a activation barrier for people. It's it's going to be really useful at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Good. But but right now it's a just, just I think it's gonna be well maybe it's gonna I don't know, it's either gonna be useful or just you know moved on to like here's how we really deal with it. I as someday, sane as sane, I, you know, community members. Someday I really want branches and, and, and forks and poles. But so the 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 mental model for a sync thing is is very straightforward, you know. It's like the file is in all the computers. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I got to jump off here. It's. Uh, I get. Uh, See you later. Yeah. Yeah. That's up. Anyway, it was wonderful, and thanks again, Mark Antoine, for the explanation. Appreciate it. Pleasure. That's all. That's all. So uh, we'll fold up and head off to work. Real work. Yeah. Thanks all. <laughs>